access to questions, statements by ministers, items under public business, and private members' motions. But before we begin, let's try a parliamentary trivia question. Is it true that a statement by a minister shall be limited to matters directly related to the subject or department with responsibility for which he has been charged, or which are of urgent importance? Is this true or false? Get the answer at the end of this introduction of the lower house. Under statements by ministers, Minister of National Security Dr. Horace Chang is down to address the house. Under public business, debate is to be concluded on a bill shortly entitled the National Identification and Registration Act 2021. In April 2019, the Constitutional Court highlighted deficiencies in the previous 2017 Act. However, these have been fully addressed in the new legislation. So, it has been strengthened and improved to recognize and protect the right of privacy of an enrolled individual, particularly as it relates to protection of data and identity information. Also on the agenda, the Disabilities Regulations 2021 resolution is to be taken and the Agricultural Loan Societies and Approved Organizations Regulations 2021 resolution is to be taken as well. Opposition spokesman on Labour, Social Security and Special Abilities, Dr. Floyd Morris has welcomed the debate on the Disabilities Regulations 2021, but he is calling for the effective date for the legislation, the Disabilities Act, will come into effect. The Disabilities Law was passed by Parliament in 2014, but the government said it could not be introduced without the regulations. The state of constituency debate is to continue with Member of Parliament for St. Andrew West Rural, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, and Member of Parliament for Kingston Central, Donovan Williams, participating. It should be noted that the agenda can be adjusted with items being added, removed, or replaced. If you are planning to attend a session, here are some rules you should keep in mind. No visitor shall create any act of disorder within the precincts of the House. No photography videography or sketching of the proceedings is allowed unless so authorized by the presiding officer. Visitors who remain within the precincts of the house during suspension of the session are asked to keep silent. It's almost time to go to the main event, but before that, let's get the answer to the parliamentary trivia question. We stated, Is it true that a statement by a minister shall be limited to matters directly related to the subject or department with responsibility for which he has been charged, or which are of urgent importance? Is this true or false? It's true. And according to the standing orders, it's also true that all papers must be presented by the minister and its presentation included in the minutes of the session. Now over to the proceedings. Mr. Davis, Mr. Brown, Dr. Brown Burke, Dr. Charles, Mr. Chin, Mr. Clark, Mr. Cousins, Ms. Crawford, Ms. Daly, Ms. Davis, Mr. Golding, Mr. Graham, Mr. Green, Dr. Guy, Ms. Hamilton, Ms. Hannah, Mr. Henry Kitts, Mr. Henry, Mr. Hilton, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Lee, Mr. Miller, Ms. Morrison, Mrs. Nita Garvey, Mr. Paulwell, Mr. Phillips, Dr. Phillips, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Sibbles, Mr. Slowly, Mrs. Vaz, Dr. Wheatley, Mr. Williams, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Witter, Mr. Wright, Mr. Clark. Madam Speaker, today there will be one statement by Minister and I invite you to ask the Minister of Finance, the Honorable Nigel Clark, to make a statement.
Madam Speaker, Madam, Madam Speaker, just arise to just give a statement and update on the request for proposals for the integrated resort development. Madam Speaker, the request for applications for the award of integrated resort development orders will be open tomorrow, August, October 6, 2021. Madam Speaker, as you and members are aware, under the Casino Gaming Act, the Minister responsible for finance may make an order declaring an integrated resort development to be an approved integrated resort development. This will enable the developer to then make an application to the Casino Gaming Commission for a license to be issued under the Act to operate a casino within that resort development. Last month, Madam Speaker, to ensure transparency of the process and the best possible returns for Jamaica, and in order to ensure that we have the best possibility that a successful applicant indeed does build and apply for and eventually operate a casino resort, I appointed a 10-member enterprise team chaired by Dr. Dana Dixon, who will receive and evaluate applicants applications from interested investors for integrated resort developments. Madam Speaker, the application process and selection of the approved integrated resort developments will be managed by that enterprise team, which includes persons with a diversity of skills and experience drawn from across the public sector and supplemented with persons with private sector experience including persons knowledgeable about our anti-money laundering and countering terrorism framework, and among other, other notable competences. The other members of the enterprise team are Ms. Roxanne Miller, Mr. Hugh Morris, Ms. Maureen Sims, Ms. Janelle Ray Bowie, Mrs. Cholette Cox, Mrs. Denise Arana, Mrs. Madge Ramsey, Ms. Mrs. Teva Russell Forbes, and Mrs. Audrey Robinson. Madam Speaker, the Casino Gaming Act was amended earlier this year to change the requirement for the designation of an integrated resort development. Changes to the requirements to be designated an integrated resort development include 1,000 hotel rooms, which was reduced from the prior requirement for 2,000 rooms. A further requirement is that 500 of the constructed rooms are to be designed and implemented as luxury rooms. And there is a minimum capital investment for an integrated resort development of 500 million US dollars. In addition, another important change included that all elements of the approved integrated resort development are to be constructed and operational within three years of the commencement of the operation of any casino activity on the development, and that failure to comply will result in a penalty. Madam Speaker, the amendments which were made to the requirements to be fulfilled by a prospective developer of an approved integrated resort development are meant to enhance the regime and to strengthen its appeal to potential investors, and by so doing to attract and increase foreign direct investment into Jamaica. As at now, Madam Speaker, there is no operating casino resort in Jamaica, despite the fact that we have had this legislation since 2010. It is our intention with the launch of this process for Jamaica to eventually have a casino gaming resort. And also, it is our intention to attract uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of investment to Jamaica via this means. Further details, including the guidelines for application, will be made public via daily newspapers and the websites of the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, www.mof.gov.jm, and JAMPRO's website, www.dobusinessjamaica.com. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, just a couple of questions for the Minister. First of all, is the 
Minist has the Ministry of Finance made provision for a secretariat to support this enterprise team? They are all seasoned professionals, but from what I know of the team, there are people who have their full-time day jobs. So is there going to be some permanent staff that will be able to support the team in its efforts? Secondly, while the enterprise team will evaluate, they have to make a recommendation ultimately to you as the minister, and ultimately the discretion as to whether to award or not would lie with you regardless of what the recommendation is. Now, in a case where you may go against that recommendation, is it proposed that you would outline the reasons that you decided not to accept or to reject the recommendation? And thirdly, there are some players who were already given, um, I don't know if it's approval, but provisional, provisional approval. Where do they sit in this scenario? And Tavistock, et cetera, and how would they, would they have to reapply, or how, how would you treat with those? Thank you for those questions. Uh, on, on the first question, yes, there will be a secretariat that will support the work of the enterprise team. The, uh, this work is domiciled in the public enterprises division of the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, and there's a deputy financial secretary who heads that division. And they'll provide, you know, they have all of the, the policy framework and have worked in this area for years. But the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service is hiring a project consultant who will work for the life of this uh, enterprise team to do the legwork and the groundwork and the day-to-day -day work to support the decision-making and analysis that the enterprise team is being asked to, uh, to do. I'll answer that as well. The, with respect to, you're correct that this is one area where the license is uh, in the hands of the minister. All right? There are other areas where we, FSC or BOJ or BGLC, in this case of an IRD uh, order, I'm using loose terms here, it is the minister who ultimately is responsible. So the expectation here is that the enterprise team will give a recommendation uh, to the minister. If I happen to disagree with the enterprise team, I will uh, make that known and give my reasons why. The purpose of this structure is, is to give some uh, transparency and an institutional framework uh, for what is an important award. Uh, with respect to prior licenses, a license was given to Celebration, I believe, in 2015. They did not, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, nothing happened or what was expected to happen did not happen and so that license was revoked. I believe uh, it was revoked either last year or the year before. With respect to uh, ha harmonization, and remember harmonization is owned 50% by the people of Jamaica. So it's really our investment even though Tavistock is the promoter of it. Uh, they received an integrated resort license I believe if I'm not mistaken, I believe in 2016 or thereabouts, they, they, that, is still, um, on, that is still a viable prospect and the progress that we would have expected them to make, they have made, a lot now depends on the government of Jamaica because you'll recall that this arrangement has its antithesis or its origination in transactions that were undertaken in 2005 or 2006 or 2007, early years, and there were tax concessions that were uh, promised and so forth. Uh, we have to uh, revive or, or put those into the current form. So there's work to be done on the government of Jamaica side. I should, that's what I'm trying to say. But that is a, a live prospect. Now, the way in which the integrated resort development orders and RFP is occurring is that we have exclusive zones and each order will be for a different area. So Harmony Cove, the idea is that they, uh, Harmony Cove is in Trelawney, so we won't have a new order in proximity to Trelawney. We expect, well, we expect in St. James or in Hanover and Westmoreland and so forth. Well, the orders are, yeah, we have geographical zones. We 
are, at this point in time, after this process is completed, a maximum of three zones. So this RFP is for a maximum of two. One zone would be St. James, and the other zone would be Hanover and Westmoreland. And, it, and once Harmony Cove comes on stream, they will have, you want, you know, you want, a, they would have, you want a zone to have a major tourism area. So with respect to Hanover and Westmoreland, there's Negril. With respect to St. James, there's Montego Bay. With respect to Harmony Cove, there's Ocho Rios. So that is the, the, the framework. And with respect to time, the uh, persons interested in making an application have four months to do so. And we expect that the analysis and award would, uh, would probably take another two months after that. Just, just one specific question on Hammer Cove. I, I'm trying to recall if you had made a specific budgetary provision to, for the government to provide its obligation. Is that going to be done in this financial year? I think what you're alluding to is that in the, in the budgetary documents, there was a loan to harmonization. Uh, I think that's what you might be referring to. It was in the budgetary documents. Um, the, we, I don't believe that the, the loan, with the six months left in the fiscal year, it may not be drawn down to the full extent of what was provided for in the budgetary documents, but uh, some amount is going to be drawn. In fact, I believe it was approved by the public bodies that are the direct shareholders of, uh, of harmonization uh, to provide uh, capital to do some of the preparatory and ancillary works. The documentation is being finalized as, you know, in terms of how that works, how much do, will they put forward, and how much, if any, harmonization will put forward, and I expect that to happen. But it will not be to the extent of what was in that provision in the budgetary documents. As you know, uh, loans are below the line, right? So it, it doesn't, uh, but, but they, have, they, they are provided for in documents that are tabled here. But the simple answer is not to the extent that uh, was in that document. Uh, Minister, I know that you mentioned that the ball is largely in the government's court for the harmonization, Harmony Cove project to move forward. I know that there was um, significant work done in the financing of the, of the development side of the project, putting that together some years now with Chinese uh, banks and so on involved. Is it still likely to be financed um, out of China, the, the project? Um, and, you know, if, given that the ball is in the government's court to sort out whatever incentives, etc., are committed to, what's the time frame for, for getting that project going and actually breaking ground? So, remember, the, the, the financing of the harmonization transaction has gone through many iterations. The, the Chinese involvement, you'll recall, was some time ago. It was, uh, I think, Actually, prior to 2010, it was, it was unraveled, or af just after 20, sorry, it, it came about uh, in the wake of the financial crisis when, the no when they could not access the channels they were planning to. The project has since moved away from that financing structure, and the, I, I wouldn't want to name the financial sources here in Parliament, there's a private uh, sector entity that's involved in terms of our partner, but the, suffice to say that the, the financing um, is all, uh, you know, on this side of the world, all in this hemisphere. Um, with respect to, so let me be clear. I mean, there's a, a lot of work to be done on the Tavistock side, right? So the, the approvals and the, some of the designs and architecture and so on. I'm speaking to um, the, the, we also, I mean, honest, that the government also has stuff to do. Uh, which primarily is to um, sort of reconcile the original intent and the original commitments with today, which means honoring in some way, shape, or form, um, and making sure it's consistent with our architecture today. I am hoping that, or I'm working towards, I would say, you know, by the, by the middle of you know, next fiscal year, to be able to have that all uh, sorted out. What we want to do, you remember in my budget presentation, I spoke to uh, updating the Large Scale and Pioneer, Pioneer Industry Act. 
Not that this would come through the act, the, the, the tax, the concessions for how many crore, but it would be, all, it would be the idea. It may not be, but the idea would be, it would be simultaneous, it would be grandfathered. At the same time, it would introduce a mechanism for any entity that's coming with an investment above a particular size, you know, over a billion dollars or whatever number we, we settle at in the end, to, to have the opportunity to be considered for incentives, provided that the total amount of incentives outstanding at any point in time is less than a certain percentage of GDP. So that's the architecture overall to allow us to accommodate what was committed to prior, prior, prior administrations, and which we have to honor in good faith, but to do so within a structure that when we agree to it with Harmony Cove, it does not unravel the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of architecture that we have today. Announcements? Laid on the table of the House today are the following. Ministry paper number 66 of 2021 entitled Annual Report on Audited Financial Statement of the Jamaica Agricultural Society for the year ended March 31, 2018. Annual Report of the National Council on Education. Annual Report of the Broadcasting Commission and Certified Appropriation Accounts for Head 19,000A, Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation for the year 2017-2018, and Head 46,000C, Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport for the year 2019-2020. Bills. Bills brought from the Senate. Bills brought from the Senate. Petitions, papers, reports from committees, notices of motions given orally, uh, question. Madam, Madam Speaker, I, I would like to inquire of the House Leader as I had tabled a private member's motion in April of this year dealing with the issue of electricity and in particular, the theft of electricity, uh, a most important issue, especially now, where we are seeing where people are suffering, legitimate um, customers of JPSCO are suffering in two ways. One, in the bills that they get, they have to pay 17% of it for other people. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, those who are paying from certain communities are seeing their electricity terminated. So my question is, this motion having been tabled on the 22nd of April, when are we going to be given a chance to debate it? And especially also, there are some proposals in it to solve the problem. And uh, I don't think the minister has treated with it with the alacrity that it deserves. And I'm urging that this be given priority treatment. So I'd like to hear from the House Leader on this matter. Uh, Madam Speaker, the, the member's question is appropriate. The truth is that um, we have had to structure Parliament in relation to, firstly, the financial debates that happened in April into May. And then now, in this session, we're dealing heavily with the state of the constituency debates. Within this frame, I have structured for the private member's motion. And I'm, to have a discussion with the, my opposite on, on that side, me, Member Hilton, to formulate properly that element of it. But I want you to be assured that private member's motions are important and have priority as far as we are concerned. And we'll definitely be dealing with that. We're finishing the state of the constituency debate. 
within the next few weeks. And after that, we go straight into making sure that private members' motions get priority. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Um, <clears throat> questions and answers to questions. Motions that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Motions relating to sittings of the House. Motions for leave to introduce bills. Presentation of bills without leave of the House first obtained. Public business. Uh, Madam Speaker, for public business today, we will have on the legislative side the Minister of Agriculture uh, taking the measures in relation to agricultural loan societies and approve organizations regulations 2021. And thereafter, we will go into the state of the constituency debate. May it please you, Madam Speaker, as you ask the Minister of Agriculture to make the presentation. Minister Shaw. Minister of Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, Madam Speaker, the in two thousand and seventeen. <coughs> Parliament passed the Agricultural Loan Societies and Approved Organizations Act, which seeks to modernize the agricultural sector to meet the nation's growing demands of food security and increased productivity. This modernization process <coughs> involves the streamlining of certain functions performed by the Agricultural Credit Board with a view to promoting greater efficiency. This streamlining process involves the dissolution of the Agricultural Credit Board and the absorption of the Board's monitoring and its inspection functions by the Registrar of Cooperative Societies. In order for the Department of Cooperative Societies to effectively perform those functions, the 31 posts of the Agricultural Credit Board were transferred to the Department of Cooperative Societies. So, Madam Speaker, this means really that the Department of Cooperative Societies really re reports to the Ministry of Industry, Investment, and Commerce. So I'm actually speaking in my capacity as Minister of Industry, Investment, and Commerce. The Act, therefore, provides a, for the repeal of the Agricultural Credit Board Act, the transfer of the relevant monitoring and inspection functions of the Agricultural Credit Board in relation to the management of agricultural loan societies to be transferred to the Registrar of Cooperative Societies. The establishment of the Agricultural Appeal Tribunal and the registration and regulation of the Agricultural Loan Societies 
and the certification of approved organizations by or under the Registrar of Cooperative Societies and matters related thereto, and several mechanisms to combat money laundering. Madam Speaker, the agricultural loan societies and approved organizations regulated by the Act are established to offer loans and give support to its members for agricultural activities and thereby promoting the growth of the agricultural sector in Jamaica. These, by the way, Madam Speaker, include the administration of the People's Cooperative Banks, PC Banks, fall under this. In order to give effect to the purposes of the Act, there is need for the promulgation of regulations to further strengthen the legislative framework. Therefore, the agricultural loan societies and approved organizations' regulations 2021, which is before us today, is being promulgated in keeping with Section 54.1 of the Act, subject to affirmative resolution. These regulations include, among other things, provisions for the following. To provide requirement for agricultural loan societies to file a copy of their rules along with the application form for registration to allow the agricultural loan societies and approved organizations to amend their rules subject to the approval of the registrar, to stipulate that all loans are to be classified as approved by the registrar in accordance with section 37 and 38 of the Act, which identifies various types of loans that can be granted by agricultural loan societies and approved organizations. Four, to, uh, to provide for the duty of agricultural loan societies and approved organizations to keep written and up-to-date records of books and documents and to submit annual reports and returns to the registrar. Five, to provide requirement for agricultural loan societies and approved organizations to prepare a monthly statement to be submitted to the committee of management of the society or the approved organization and the registrar at its first meeting. Six, to provide for the requirement of every agricultural loan society and approved organization to supply its secretary or any other officer authorized to receive monies with a receipt book approved by the registrar and further to follow standard accounting procedures. Seven, to provide for the power of the registrar to examine the books, securities, records, and all cash in hand of an agricultural loan society or approved organization at the request of the registrar or an officer authorized by the registrar. Eight, to require the secretary or an authorized officer of an agricultural loan society or approved organization to lodge all funds of the society or approved organization to a bank approved by the registrar, a reputable bank, in the name of the society or approved organization. Nine, to provide for the power to the registrar to at any time require an agricultural loan society and approved organization to make provision for the safekeeping of cash, securities, documents, and other property of the society or approved organization. 10, to provide for the duty of the agricultural loan society and approved organization to immediately notify the registrar of any change in the persons 
holding the office of chairman, treasurer, secretary, manager, or any other office including the person authorized to sign checks. 11, to provide for the requirement of every agricultural loan society and approved organization at the end of each year to forward to each member of the society and approved organization a financial statement. 12, to provide for various prescribed forms and fees such as the registration and certification fees. And 13, to provide for the penalty for offenses under the regulation. So Madam Speaker, this is the Agricultural Loan Societies and Approved Organizations Regulations 2021, which is to streamline the process of the dissolution of the Agricultural Credit Board and the absorption of the board's monitoring and inspection functions by the Registrar of Cooperative Societies. And in order to do this, Madam Speaker, the 31 posts of the Agricultural Credit Board were transferred to the, Deba the Department of Cooperative Societies. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I may. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I thank um, the Honorable Minister wearing yet again his new hat for his presentation of these regulations or the resolution to approve them. Just some questions, Minister, because I know we seem to spend a lot of time in this House dealing with legislation which often doesn't seem to have an immediate impact. So. <coughs> You know, we've passed partnership legislation. I don't see anything really happening there. International trusts and corporate services we passed. Now there's a big bill to amend it, but I don't see anything happening there. And I just wondered, this concept of the Agricultural Loan Society and approved organizations, Minister, how many functional and active agricultural loan societies do we have in Jamaica now? And what roughly would be their total assets under management? Just to get a sense of what size we're dealing with um, in, uh, and what impact they're having on the agricultural sector and the economy. Because we're spending time developing regulations, moving posts from one defunct public body into the Department of Cooperative Societies. But I'm just trying to get a sense of really what's going on behind all this. And again, you know, when one looks at the regulations, one sees a lot of additional requirements for, I suppose, more modern uh, governance and financial probity in the way these um, financial entities, loan societies, and approved organizations function. But I, there's not much in here in terms of to try and incentivize more um, the capital formation flowing into agriculture through this mechanism. It, to the contrary, with additional regulation comes additional complexity, additional cost, and quite often with the uh, more informal or less well-endowed uh, community-type financial institutions, they struggle to comply with heavier doses of regulation. So I was just really interested to know you know, what really are we dealing with in practice? How many of these agricultural loan societies are there functioning now, actively functioning? What is the total assets under management of, the, of these entities? Uh, and um, what do you see as a future for them in terms of as a, as, a, as a mechanism by which the agricultural sector can raise finance? I'm interested in, in your thoughts on that. Thank you, Minister. Minister. Minister, before you come to respond, the, for quite some time now, the, the Registrar of Cooperative Societies Act was being considered for some 
comes in for some discussion for amendments in itself. Could you say where, where are those considerations for the amendment and whether in light of the, 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 the failure to amend the Cooperative Societies, Registration, Registrar of Cooperative Societies Act itself, how, whether the absorption of the Cooperative Credit, um, credit the Agricultural Credit Board and, and, and an approved organization, how will that, that process be enhanced or accommodated um, by really an act that itself needs to be reformed and has been considered for, this, for reform for quite some time? The, the Registrar of Department of, of Cooperative and, Reg and Societies Act has been considered for some time. The discussion was certainly when I was minister to look at that to see um, how we can reform that, the, the Cooperative Societies Act, how we can reform that piece of legislation. Now, the, to bring under its umbrella um, the, the Agricultural Credit Board um, and to try to absorb that. The question is, how will that proceed under this um, existing and really outdated um, piece of legislation? Still functioning. They also do charities. Yeah, but needs to be modernized and carrying with it quite, carrying with, with it quite a number of important regulatory activities. Madam Speaker, on the questions that have been asked, first of all, let me say that the, by far the, the dominant agricultural uh, banks would definitely be the, the PC, the People's Cooperative Banks. That is the, that's the main one. And uh, the actual assets of the National People's, People's Cooperative Bank is, is in the region of $3 billion. And you know, um, I think it's important that we remember that a lot of small farmers, they don't get a loan from a regular bank. <clears throat> they have come to depend on the PC banks over the years. <clears throat> and of course, the PC, the PC banks are still in existence. Of course, some of them have fallen on hard times, right? But by and large, the PC banks are still functioning and are still providing loans to small farmers. The only difference now with this new administration that I have announced today is that the Agricultural Credit Board will no longer be the supervising arm for these agricultural banks. It will be combined now with the cooperative societies. And the Registrar of Cooperative Societies is the one that will now administer these agricultural loan uh, institutions. So I'm um, not too sure about this question that you had asked. Um, yes, well, I, and, and I agree with you that there needs to be some tidying up that has to be done. Um, with, you, we have to see it now as a kind of a, a work in progress, right? Um, And in fact, in this situation, as you can see, where the Agricultural Credit Board used to report to the Minister of Agriculture, um, in this particular situation, because it's being, the, the, all of the staff and everybody are being transferred to the Department of Cooperative Societies, that does similar types of loans. On, on small scales to small business people. So um, it actually has a crossover function between the two ministries of industry, investment, and commerce and agriculture. Um, the staff, of course, from the Agricultural Credit Board 
was already transferred and are integrated um, into the operations of the Registrar of Cooperative Societies. But I agree with the, mem the, the, the member that this is still work in progress. We still have more tidying up that has to be done. And I'll be happy to share discussions with you and get your ideas as to how that can be further advanced. Thank you. I, I conclude by asking that, um, that this motion be approved. Members of the House, the question before us is that the motion be approved. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Motion approved. Madam Speaker, we will now... Uh, going to the state of constituency debate. Our speakers today are Honorable Juliet Cosberg Phil Flynn, St. Andrew West Rural, and Donovan Williams MP, Kingston Central. Madam Speaker. Minister Cuthbert Flynn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm grateful to stand here today to give another constituency update on behalf of the beautiful people of St. Andrew West Rural. In making, my, in making my contribution to the state of the constituency debate today, I want to thank the many persons who have made it possible for me to stand here today. I thank my councillors, John Myers, who's here, Rowan Hall, <laughs> Tasha Schwab, for their commitment and diligence. Thanks to my management team that worked relentlessly for victory, also my driver, Rambo, and my close protection officer. To my very young, brilliant, he's right there, high school social media guru, Kajani Williams, who made sure I was on point with my post during my campaign. I will forever be grateful to my party workers and the people of St. Andrew West Rural who thought it fit to return me as member of parliament, the persons someone referred to as a silver medalist, stands here today, the first Olympian elected to this honorable house. And, and a second term, and a second term member of parliament. My dedication and love for the people propelled me to a resounding 3,000 margin victory. I stand proudly, proudly at the podium today to represent the constituency and the people of West Rural. To the most honorable Prime Minister Andrew Holness, I thank you for your trust and confidence in me to continue my journey and service to the people of Jamaica, which I have been doing since I was 16 years old as well as for appointing me Minister of State and the Minister of Health and Wellness. To Lavon, my husband, my best friend and rock, thank you. Thank you for listening to the many frustrated moments. To my beautiful Zara, who asked me if I'm going to my, asked me if I'm going to my constituency once she sees me leaving the house. Thank you, my love. Madam Speaker, I want to begin my presentation by reminding the people of this country that the role of a member of parliament, first and foremost, 
is to make laws for good governance. My many titles have been bestowed upon us, but if we want to move this country forward, we must make sure our citizens understand what our major role is as parliamentarians. With that, I implore my colleagues to scrutinize all the archaic laws and begin to amend them in order to build back stronger. I believe we have to move forward with our legislative agenda and to make sure our laws are modern, progressive, and represent the society that we now live in. If we have laws that will not advance our people, then we suffer as a nation. I applaud the Honorable Minister Olivia Babsy Grange, who piloted the Sexual Harassment Bill 2021, which was passed in the House and the Senate. We see our bright State Minister Robert Nesta Morgan tackling the cruel act of child abuse, a chronic problem in our country. There is now a 211 hotline for any child or to dial if he or she is sexually, physically, emotionally abused. This, Madam Speaker, shows the strength and keen understanding of my colleague parliamentarians and this government that we care about the most vulnerable in our society. Another role MPs have is to lobby on behalf of our constituents for improved infrastructural development. Many times we're told by voters that we haven't given them anything in hand and they will not return to vote. But I want to express that it is time they advance their thinking and instead request improved social infrastructure from their political representatives. Our job as policymakers is to implement effective, effective social policies so that the generation to come will be better off. I strongly believe that this government will make that a reality. <laughs> Madam Speaker, it has been a challenging year for all of us as we have not been able to do as much as we would like to in our constituencies due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But I want to assure the people of St. Andrew West Rural and Jamaica that we will get the job done. Our Prime Minister, the Most Honourable Andrew Holness, and the team at MOH, led by our Super Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. The Honourable Christopher Tufton, are steering the country in the right direction. We, we have seen more than $60 billion spent to respond to the COVID-19 challenges, and according to Dr. Nigel Clark's tabled supplementary budget, there will be an increase from 60 billion to 75 billion to facilitate a timely recovery from the pandemic and its effect. Madam Speaker, on topic of COVID-19, I want to announce that there is now a permanent vaccination site in Stony Hill Division of my constituency that is open Mondays to Fridays from 9 to 3 at the Stony Hill Heart Academy. And I am urging all of my constituents to get vaccinated. Before this, I made sure that in the initial rollout of the community-based vaccination plan, the citizens of West Rural St. Andrew had access to vaccines, and in doing so, three vaccination blitz sites were established throughout the constituency. I don't want to hear that COVID is not in West Rural, because it is, and many have died from my constituency, and there's some still in the hospital. I urge you to take the vaccine as it saves lives and continue to adhere to the COVID-19 protocol. Madam Speaker, we are lucky to have this government at the helm because many countries are struggling to pay their bills at this time due to the pandemic. Dr. Nigel Clark at the helm of our finance ministry is keeping us financially safe as we navigate this trying time. Through his prudent and disciplined fiscal policies which guide us, through his continued steady guidance, just yesterday, we saw the International Credit Rating Agency, agency S&P, affirming GOJ's B+, long-term B, <laughs> short-term credit ratings, and revised the outlook from negative to stable. <laughs> Minister Tufton's solution-oriented approach to the many challenges the pandemic has placed on our health sector is wise and instructive. And through it all, our Prime Minister exemplified the thoughtfulness, patience, and level-headed thinking, which in this particular time in our history demands from its leader. We have the best team at the right time. Yeah. Tourism has taken a really hard hit due to the pandemic. 
I want to express how grateful I am for the funding through the Tourism Enhancement Fund this year. I want to thank Minister of Tourism, the Honorable Edmund Bartlett, for the annual funding through the TEF Spruce Up Jamaica campaign. I have utilized my funding yearly to focus on education. Earlier in 2021, I was delighted to welcome the Honorable Minister to West Royal at the opening of the Rocky Valley Computer Center in Stony Hill. With the funding of $4 million, we refurbished the space and outfitted it with 11 computers and a printer. Without internet access, the center would be useless. So I reach out to the Universal Service Fund, and without delay, the center received free Wi-Fi. Even with the pandemic, the center has been operational and is overseen by the Citizens Association in Stony Hill. Madam Speaker, once again, Minister Bartlett has granted another allocation, and my focus will be on community development in an eco-friendly way. I have identified and received no objection letters for land in the community of Golden Valley in the Brandon Hill area, which I believe is an ideal spot for a community park. The space, the space is being used as dumping site for old cars and garbage, and it's unsightly because it's right across from the primary school. A community park can be of great mental health reliever providing a safe space for relaxation for families and safe play area for children. So this part, Madam Speaker, will have a walking path for exercise, a play area for the children, barbecue pit for family gatherings. The second phase of the of, we'll see the football field being upgraded with gold nets and a better surface. I will combine my funding from the Constituency Development Fund with funds from the TEF for this financial year. This will be a safe space for our children and family for physical activity and entertainment. The Golden Valley community will have a new look once this is completed. As our great country strives for prosperity, rural development must be an integral part of the process. And I'm happy to know that this government understands and has a political will to make this happen. Hence, the government's sharp focus on rural development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, I have big plans for the development, John Myers, for Lawrence Tavern Division, a town that has outgrown its space. Yeah. And there, there are three areas of focus, water, roadways, infrastructure. Madam Speaker, currently, there is a $789 million water project for Essex Hall, and it has been approved in the budget and is on track. The funds have been identified, and they're now in the design phase of this project to finally fix the long-standing water crisis in Lawrence Tavern. Here, here. This will supply the entire Lawrence Tavern area from burn shop to border. <laughs> it's a part of it. Madam Speaker, but even before this project materialized, there has been great effort by the NWC to upgrade pipelines across the constituency and metering of new customers in areas such as Fern Hill, Prospect Hall, Kushni Road, Coakley, and in the King Western area. Water to all communities must be a priority for sustainable development. I look forward to more communities being upgraded with larger pipelines and consistent water supply. This is something that is ongoing with NWC in West Rural St. Andrew. As it relates to infrastructure, I want to thank the Honorable Desmond McKenzie and his State Minister Homer Davis for the initiative to develop five town squares to the tune of $600 million. Well, Madam Speaker, I have chosen Lawrence Tavern Square as one of the squares to be developed this financial year. Minister Omar Davis and along with my counselor John Myers and I tour the area and work should begin this financial year. The square is congested and is badly in need of reconfiguring, so I look forward to what's to come for the people and the business of Lawrence Tavern. Madam Speaker, having one of the largest constituencies with a wide network of well-traveled roads, I face a steep battle like many in here, 
but I'm never daunted because over 15 roadways have been completely rehabilitated since 2016. I have the will to battle anything. Yes. One major thoroughfare that needs immediate attention is Mount Ogle to Lawrence Tavern. Thousands travel this daily on this roadway and it has several breakaways. The narrowing of the roadway is dangerous for JUTC and other vehicles to traverse. And last year after the rainfall, Madam Speaker, and undermining, a car misjudged and slipped off the roadway. Luckily, the heavy vegetation of trees prevented serious harm. A team has been sent um, from NAA and has visited the site and estimates have been done for three walls in the area. So I look forward to the start of the construction. Madam Speaker, I wish to applaud the Honorable Minister Everett Warmington for the patching program that has commenced in my constituency. We have, we have had patching, we have had patching in all four divisions, Red Hills, Brandon Hill, Lawrence Tavern, and Stony Hill, which, and this will continue. Lisa, we saw patching in your constituency. Go on. We see patching going on in your constituency. <laughs> <laughs> we, know that, we know that the pandemic halted a number of ro road rehabilitations this year, but I'm happy to announce that the main road from Temple Hall to Lawrence Tavern Square is being considered for total rehabilitation, and I know in time a new surface will be a reality as long as I am Member of Parliament. There are many other roads which I hope to see completely rehabilitated during the roadways, stretching from the foot of Stony Hill to St. Mary Border, which is a major thoroughfare, as well as East Kirkland Heights in the Red Hills Division. Madam Speaker, as I move away from Lawrence Tavern for a moment, I want to express that garbage collection is one of the most challenging problems I face in St. Andrew's Rural, especially in the Lawrence Tavern Red Hills and Stony Hill. Madam Speaker, I ask that the Speaker be given sufficient time to complete her presentation. The question. Thank you, the Madam Speaker. The question before the House is that the Speaker be given sufficient time to complete her presentation. Those in favour? Those against? Minister? Thank you, Madam Speaker. The problem with the garbage is twofold. Residents and businesses, businesses not paying to dispose of their waste and a shortage of garbage trucks. I acknowledge the work of our government has been doing in acquiring many garbage trucks over the last few years. And I ask for more to be procured to meet the demand of garbage collection. I've made attempts to address this issue in the past using my Christmas program from the Sanitation Fund. But, Madam Speaker, this requires a long-term solution. This is something I believe, I believe definitely needs to be addressed and for a closer look to be taken at the keeping of our surroundings clean. My councillors and I, this Thursday, will be doing a walkthrough with the members from MPM Waste Management to look at the issues and find solutions. Madam Speaker, this pandemic has taught us so much about our health and the benefit of a resilient healthcare system. Commendations to the government for the numerous renovations and construction of health centers across the country over the last five years, with what, one such renovation taking place last term at the Stony Hill Health Center. Primary healthcare, Madam Speaker, is important to treat non-life-threatening illnesses which in turn reduce the strain on the hospitals. I must commend my health minister, Dr. The Honorable Christopher Tufton, who is focusing on preventative measure of health and wellness by zooming in on lifestyle choices. Madam Speaker, this takes me to Lawrence Tavern Health Center, which treats over 200 patients daily. Currently, this space is inadequate and needs a complete renovation because it's an ad hoc place. The center accommodates patients coming as far as Glengough in St. Mary, which borders West Rural. 
Madam Speaker, I'm happy to announce that a new building is coming for a new building is is coming as the National Health Fund and Chase will undertake this project for the 2022 financial year. And here, take a look, take a look. <laughs> to the people of to the people of Lawrence Tavern, your roads, infrastructure, and water are my priority, and to add that the work will continue throughout all four divisions in West Rural St. Andrew. One by one, I will get the job done as your Member of Parliament, working to address working to address the many issues which affect us in the great constitu constituency of West Rural St. Andrew. Madam Speaker, what a tough 18 months it has been for our children. Many have lost over a year of school due to not having a device or lacking internet connectivity, and my constituency is not exempt from this issue. I applaud our Education Minister, the Honorable Fable Williams, and her ministry for their work in providing device to many students and working in tandem with Minister Dal Vaz in a continued effort to push greater internet accessibility. In the push for greater internet accessibility, a tour was done recently with Universal Service Fund to determine potential areas in West Rural to establish uh, free community Wi-Fi. Madam Speaker, the theft of cable wires, especially in the Padmore and Cooper's Hill area, is a devastating problem. Last week I spoke with a child and he said he hadn't been online in over a year. These common criminals are causing a deficiency in learning for our children. We know that in 2017, the then, Carl, the then Minister Carl Samuda had banned export of copper wire with immediate effect. The scrap metal trade is big business and we still have thieves cutting cable wires and disrupting internet service. I believe the cable companies are making improvements, replacing copper with newer technology to prevent these disruptions. And I'm even more hopeful after listening to the Honorable Minister Darrell Vaz's presentation in Parliament last week that improvements will be seen across the island. However, I do believe, Madam Speaker, that we need, we need to also consider looking at legislating stiffer penalties for cable theft because as the world shifts and moves into the fourth industrial revolution for Jamaica to keep up, we have to make sure our technological infrastructure is also protected. Madam Speaker, the Constituency Development Fund has been a great source of help for the people. And I'm pleased each year, especially when I can assist with tertiary education. Over the past four years, my office has assisted over 240 students back to college. This year, I have a record of 92 students who are assisted with tertiary grants from my CDF. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the CDF is not a slush fund as some journalists purport from time to time. We're making a difference. Just last Friday, a graduate called me to say, Miss Juliet, I'm now a graduate of the University of the West Indies with second class honors in nursing, and I want to thank you for the assistance that you have given me over the years. We are serving our constituents. <laughs> Madam Speaker, no two constituencies are alike, and another of my greatest challenges is housing assistance. I receive over 1,500 requests a year, and the funding can really only assist about 200 persons. I'm asking for a review of the allocation and for the consideration of affordable housing solutions to be established in West Rural St. Andrew. It's also for this reason I'm even more grateful for the foresight of the HOPE program. Madam Speaker, the housing component of the HOPE program, initiated by the Most Honorable Prime Minister, was a strategic move to develop and improve housing conditions of the country's poor and disadvantaged population. I'm proud to say that St. Andrew West Rural has been a recipient of five such houses and keys handed over. I look forward to more persons throughout West Rural um, on this program. The great people of West Rural are grateful and thank you. This is truly meant to move people from poverty to prosperity. 
Madam, Madam Speaker, unfortunately, crime and violence are of great concern in my West Rural in Stone, especially in the Stone Hill area. I thank Minister Matthew Samuda, Minister Without Portfolio and the Ministry of National Security, who visited the area to get a better understanding of operations and crime fighting strategies uh, utilized in the area, as well to review the current infrastructure and technology. Stemming from this tour, we see we will see the enhancing of technology used for security and crime fighting with the setting up of Jamaica Eye throughout the area. This will be a reality in the coming months. Madam Speaker, I'm eagerly anticipating the start of a well-needed renovation <laughs> of the Stone Hill Police Station and the Justice Center. These are important renovations so families can be protected. <laughs> there, there has been an upsurge in domestic violence, and I believe the Justice Center can assist with counseling and mediation by teaching better ways to communicate. The police have been housed in containers in anticipation for the renovation, and so this is an urgent call. In the same breath, though, Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the government for the refurbishing of the Lawrence Tavern Police Station. The officers are now more comfortable. We have, while we have main roads and parochial roads need fixing, parts of West Rural are farming communities. Approximately four farm roads have been completely re rehabilitated, and I express gratitude to the government. Last year, RADA rehabilitated Coakley and Belmore in the Brandon Hill area. Both communities also had new pipelines installed, with many residents are now NWC customers. This year, Madam Speaker, Rose Hall in Lawrence Tavern is about to commence to a tune of $8 million. Many more farm roads need refurbishing throughout West Rural, and I will continue to advocate for rehabilitation. This is a working government. Thanks to Member of Parliament, Floyd Green, who supported this initiative while serving as Agriculture Minister. The farming community in West Rural is robust with bee farmers, coffee farmers, animal and produce. I have granted all groups over $100,000 in seeds, bees, chicken, fertilizer, you name it, from my PIP allocation from the Agriculture Ministry. I'm grateful that under the then Minister Floyd Green, we were allocated $740,000 to assist our farmers, and I look forward to the continued support for the farmers across West Rural. Sports. The Rocky Valley Sporting Complex has a football field a mini stadium with seating and a netball court. We have underestimated, I think, what sports can do for our youths. Sports can be a catalyst for change. Many of our rural children need an outlet with the wide open spaces that they have. Sports certainly changed my life for the better. I went from a country girl in Port Moran to the second fastest woman in the world, not once, but twice. Sports, sports has given me opportunities many only dream of. Madam Speaker, I believe every child should at least have an outlet to play a sport. In the Red Hills area, a multi-sports complex was granted through the SDF and Minister Grange a few years ago. And Madam Speaker, last year, the Rocky Valley complex in the, the netball fencing was refurbished for $250,000 from my CDF as well as lights were installed through a partnership with Rural Electrification and my CDF, costing $1.4 million. The basketball netball area needs resurfacing, and I'm now appealing again to the SDF for assistance to resurface this court and also to supply a new basketball hoop. Sports can, be, sports can impact and improve lives, which I'm a testament to that and in the area of focus for my constituency for the continued expansion of sporting facilities right across West Rural. Madam Speaker, as I close, I want the people of West Rural St. Andrew to know that no matter how challenging the task, I stand committed and I will continue to lobby on their behalf. We have a lot of work to do, but we will get it done as their Member of Parliament. I will continue to work to address their needs.
I believe in my Prime Minister. I believe in the Cabinet. And I also believe in my bright Member of Parliament colleagues to steer us through this unprecedented time. I believe in my people, and I know that this Andrew Holness-led government can lead this country to prosperity and build back stronger. God bless you, God bless my constituency, and God bless West Rural St. Andrew. God bless Jamaica. So, Madam Speaker, we'll now have the presentation from MP Donovan Williams, Central Kingston. This one needs a special applause. Madam Speaker, permission to speak from a seat other than mine? Grateful. Madam Speaker, it is with a deep sense of pride that I stand in this honorable house to represent the people of Central yes. Kingston. September 3, 2020 represents a historic occasion for the constituency as it ushered in a new era of representation. After more than four decades of social, economic and infrastructure stagnation. Madam Speaker, I want to thank God for his grace and mercy bestowed on me. And I am deeply indebted to my parents, Merle and Tommy, the latter of blessed memory, for instilling in me from my childhood principles of sacrifice and service to my fellow men. I also want to recognize the officers of the Jamaica Labour Party and leader, Most Honorable Prime Minister Andrew Holness, Holness for selecting me to represent the party in a constituency previously viewed as a bastion of the other major party. Most Honorable Prime Minister and party leader, I benefited tremendously from the many strategic sessions you conducted for first-time candidates. To the leaders of Era Council 1, Honorable Desmond Mackenzie and Councillor Winston Ennis, your visionary and exemplary leadership have made the Era Council stronger, yes. and I thank you for your continued support. <laughs> Madam Speaker, many were the naysayers. They said it could not be done, that I was wasting my time. Yes. However, I recall during one of the many motivational speeches to first-time candidates, chairman of this natural party, the Honorable Robert Montague said, and I quote, there are 63 seats in Parliament. Yes. One is there for you. Awesome. Go and get it. <laughs> and I got it. I'll be speaking from another seat. <laughs> Madam Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to recognize my brother. Absolutely. His Worship. Absolutely. His Worship the Mayor, Senator, 
and Councillor Delroy Williams as well for his astute leadership Absolutely. and guidance as I enter the political arena. Madam Speaker, I am also obliged, I'm also obliged to recognize Councillor for the Raytown Division. Miss Rosalie Hamilton, for her years of dedicated service and sacrifice for and on behalf of the people of Central Kingston. Her steadfastness over the years paved the way for the resounding victory on September 3, 2020. Also recognize the constituent. I also recognize the constituency executive team, supervisors, and workers for your sterling contribution in securing this milestone. Most of all, I want to thank the people of Central Kingston for the faith placed in me. Tough seat. Madam Speaker, I discovered early upon entering the constituency that among the myriad of develop development challenges affecting the constituency were poor housing infrastructure, unbridled crime and violence, high levels of unemployment, lack of skills training opportunities, improper garbage disposal, deteriorated roads and rundown recreational facilities. Since elected in September 2020, I have undertaken numerous initiatives aimed at ameliorating the named challenges, which I will outline in sequential order. Before doing so, it must be noted that despite the said interventions and initiatives, the named challenges will not vanish overnight as they were created over a prolonged period and have become deeply entrenched in the fabric of the constituency. Consequently, it will take at least three to four years of sustained social and economic interventions to achieve the desired impact. One of the main pillars of my campaign, Madam Speaker, was to tackle the issue of dilapidated housing structures in Central Kingston and the general infrastructure decay that exists. Already we have begun this journey. One of the factors that I found working against improved housing is that many persons are not titled owners of properties. Despite occupying these properties for many years in sole, undisturbed and uninterrupted possession and in some cases paying property taxes. When engaged, they express that they are reluctant to improve the space, the dwellings, because they do not want persons to arbitrarily turn up claiming to be owners and then they lose their investment. Therefore, one of the ways to help address this matter is to use the process of law to regularize these occupants and help them to acquire title. This will not only empower them, it will also engender a sense of pride and enable them to access home improvement loans and grants to upgrade their homes. It is within this context that I am pleased to report to this honourable house yeah. and the people of Central Kingston that the Tel Aviv, Southside and Rose Gardens, Rose Gardens areas of the constituency have been ordered a land administration management program project area under the Cadastral Mapping and Tenure Clarification Special Provision Act. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this order has the effect of facilitating the cadastral mapping of the parcels of land therein so that new titles can be issued and the existing certificate of titles can be upgraded. Simply put, simply put, the residents of these communities by virtue of this order, now have a less cumbersome path to becoming titled owners yes. for the parcel of land they yes. currently occupy. I have been advised by Madam Registrar of Titles, and I do verily believe that in due course an adjudication committee will be set up to specifically hear applications for new titles. I will also be collaborating with the National Land Agency to organize sensitization clinics to guide qualified residents on how to go about the process. 
It is my intention also, Madam Speaker, to lobby the Constituency Development Fund Committee of this Honourable House to make allowance for members of Parliament under the social housing project type to be able to arrange and finance periodic title clinics where attorneys at law specialising in land law at subsidised rates can advise residents on how to successfully go about this process. This is in addition to other sensitisation efforts carried out by the National Land Agency. Madam Speaker, this approach, in my view, would be consistent with the spirit of the CDF in assisting with improving our social housing stock. Madam Speaker, I'm fully aware that the approach to improving the housing stock will require partnership with private and public entities. I am pleased to report that the National Housing Trust has agreed to upgrade and renovate the Fleet Street housing scheme in Southside, popularly known as SITE, under its scheme upgrade program. Excellent. Madam Speaker, this is a game changer. Built in the 1980s, the scheme is home to over 500 residents. And since its construction has not benefited from any form of government upgrade assistance, since 1980s, no form of assistance. I, I, I concur. In the 80s, it was new. Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, this upgrade, this upgrade will give the scheme a much needed facelift. It will it will include painting of the building, yes. pavement of the pathways, yes. waterproofing. Yes. Replacement of entrance and exit gates, yes. pavement of parking areas, yes. raising sections of the perimeter fence yes. to ward off intruders, yes. landscaping, among other things. Yes. Madam Speaker, as I said, this is a game changer, and the people of Southside will be very, very pleased. They will now be proud. Because, Madam Speaker, one of the ways to improve our, 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 our community and eliminate crime and violence is to improve our aesthetics. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. And impose a, instill a sense of pride in the yes. residents. Madam Speaker, still on the topic of social housing, I'm very pleased to report that the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation has under its social housing project, which my uh, colleague, um, Honourable Minister mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the, the, the Ministry has approved the construction of 12 housing units on lands owned by the UDC on Hanover Street in the Tel Aviv era of the constituency. Wow. Madam Speaker, this will endure to the benefit. Yes, and we have gotten. I'm coming, dear Minister. This will. <laughs> I'll come here, Minister. Yes. This will inure to the benefit of persons currently living on land in undesirable conditions, as well as other vulnerable persons in desperate need of housing assistance. I'm telling you, Madam Speaker, the people are eagerly awaiting the construction. Madam Speaker, through the Ministry of Local Government, and I want to say thank you, Honourable Desmond Mackenzie, we have received just last week two. We have started, the, the engineers have started the analysis for two indigent houses in the south side era of the constituency. And, and Madam Speaker, we have chosen two of the most, what I would say, dilapidated, rundown, and these are houses that are occupied by elderly, elderly residents, Madam Speaker. And so we think it's a worldwide venture, and I want to say thank you to the Minister of Local Government and the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal, Municipal Corporation for their assistance. Madam Speaker, this is a big one. Yes. Yes. Real estate investors. Real estate investors, Madam Speaker. Yes. 
have also expressed serious interest in constructing housing solutions in central Kingston. And I am pleased to report that suitable lands have been identified and earmarked. The discussions and the negotiations are in its early stages, but they are very promising. It entails the construction of vertical housing units in a gated environment setting with the beautiful Kingston Harbour and Palisados. Providing the background for a picturesque and breathtaking view. Madam Speaker, many, many, Madam Speaker, many of our working residents would welcome the opportunity to purchase a home in the constituency where they, are, where they have lived most, if not all, their lives. Yes, exactly. I am serious about housing, Madam Speaker. And I continue through the Constituency Development Fund social housing allocation to assist residents with housing materials. Today, we have issued approximately 200 housing assistance benefits across the constituency and continuing. Madam Speaker, crime and violence is a challenge in the constituency. Since the start of the year, the communities across the constituency have been experiencing a significant increase in murders and shootings. This can be traced, Madam Speaker, to September 3, 2020, where three people were shot and injured by armed thugs at the intersection of Foster Lane and Law Street in the south side district of Parade Gardens. Subsequently, this has spilled over to other sections of the constituency, resulting in reprisals between rival factions, culminating in the current wave of murders and shootings bedeviling the constituency. It is important to note, Madam Speaker, that the constituency spans two police divisions, namely the Kingston Central and Kingston Eastern. The You know, I, 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 I sit waiting on your guidance. So um, the member's time is up, and I respectfully move, Madam Speaker, that the member's time be extended sufficiently to allow him to conclude his presentation. Members, a question before the House is that the member's time be extended to allow him to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Member? Indeed obliged, Madam Speaker, and to the members of this Honorable House. Yes, Madam Speaker, as I indicated earlier, the, the constituency spans two police divisions, namely the Kingston Central and Kingston Eastern Police Divisions. For the year 2021, up to September 30, the sections of the constituency which fall in the Kingston Central Division, namely Tel Aviv, Southside, Almontown, and Rose Gardens, have recorded 46 murders. Madam Speaker, sections of the Franklin Town, Ray Town, and Southside community fall within the Kingston Eastern Police Division. And up to September 30, Eight murders were recorded compared to 11 murders for the corresponding period of 2020. Five shootings were recorded since January 2021 to date, compared to seven shootings for the corresponding period in 2020. Therefore, on the eastern side, Madam Speaker, we have made marginal improvements. I want to publicly, com publicly commend the hardworking members of both divisions, led respectively by Superintendent Beresford Williams, Kingston Central, and Superintendent Tommy Lee Chambers, Kingston Eastern, for their unwavering commitment to uphold law and order in the constituency. In, re in, rec in recent weeks, the police have stepped up their operations in these troubled communities by setting up buffers and conducting joint police military operations. It is worth noting that this is happening in a national ethos, Madam Speaker, where policing these volatile communities is becoming more challenging. 
On this note, I would like to send my deepest and sincere condolences to the family members and loved, loved ones of the late District Constable Kemar Armstrong, who on Friday, September 24, 2021, was executed by armed thugs at his residence in Kingston Gardens. It is my hope, Madam Speaker, that the perpetrators will be brought to justice. Madam Speaker, there is a need for more resources to be deployed to these police divisions so that the police can better e be equipped to curtail the scourge of crime and violence. I am delighted to report that the Franklin Town Police Station has been upgraded. This new station will include improved barracks for officers, spacious guard room, a separate area for recording of statements, improved washrooms, conference rooms for debriefing and strategic security planning, and a more customer service oriented structure. I want to say, in addition, new service vehicles have been provided. New service vehicles have been provided to help improve the mobility and the efficiency of the police. To the Minister of National Security and his team, I want to say, Honourable Minister, we thank you for this upgrade. It is indeed time. Madam Speaker, we must improve our community infrastructure to support and enhance effective policing. Against this background, I have begun improving the community road networks to enhance the navigability of the police throughout the constituency. There are also several broken and misplaced drainage covers, especially in the communities of Parade Gardens and Rose Gardens, which hinder traffic flow and pose a risk of injury to residents. In partnership with, with Councillor Rosalie Hamilton, I have been working diligently on repairing and replacing these drain covers. Some of the community roads that we have already rehabilitated, Madam Speaker, include Stephen Lane, High Auburn Street, Portland Road, Lacey Road, Marlborough Road, Kensington Avenue, Malvern Avenue, Norman Crescent, sections of Blake Road and Cloverley Road. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to report that, that an additional six community roads will be rehabilitated in short order, namely Price Lane, Wagonet Crescent, Tower Street from Maiden Lane to Lower South Camp Road, Blake Road between North Street and Victoria Avenue, Arnold Road and Andrews Lane. And I want to say thanks and I am indeed grateful to, to the Honourable Minister Everald Warmington. Madam Speaker. I must also say thanks to the Most Honourable Prime Minister for his Christmas allocation last year, which we utilised in, in repairing a lot of these community roads. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to report also that the Mayor of Kingston and Councillor Rosalie Hamilton have asked me to partner with them to transfer sections of Tower Street into a business and entertainment strip. This is a work in progress to, de to develop the infrastructure and encourage business activities along the strip. We have met with current and potential business operators to discuss the scope of the project. Part of the infrastructure works to be done include replacement of drainage covers and road rehabilitation, which we have already commenced. This project will complement the boardwalk soon to be completed as part of the shoreline protection works taking place at Port Royal Street between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Raytown Fishing Village. The project is a brainchild of His Worship the Mayor and is consistent with his vision to transform the spaces downtown. The Central Kingston is critical to this vision. Madam Speaker, I will continue to partner with the Community Safety and Security Branch of the JCF, the Peace Management Initiative, Justices of the Peace, the churches and other stakeholders in communicating the message of peace across the constituency. Madam Speaker, I want to turn to employment. As we all know, the ongoing pandemic has profoundly disrupted the livelihood of many Jamaicans 
and has led to the biggest economic fallout in the country's history. Notwithstanding, the government's astute handling of the economy has led to an, a steady increase in employment due to a surge in key industries, one of which is the construction industry, which continues to enjoy stellar growth. This government's thrust to boost economic growth and job creation through infrastructural development has had a positive impact on the constituency. There are two major infrastructure projects currently taking place in the constituency, Madam Speaker, namely the Kingston Harbour Revetment Project, also known as the Shoreline Protection Project, and the Kingston and St. Andrew Pipeline Replacement Project along Beeston Street and North Street. These projects have provided employment for over 100 residents, Madam Speaker. Nonetheless, unemployment remains a major challenge across the gamut of the constituency. And so, Madam Speaker, it is in this light that we welcome, we welcome the construction of the new parliament building, which will provide... This, this new parliament building, which falls significantly in the constituency of Central Kingston, Madam Speaker, we are happy that construction will commence in the near future. And the people of Central Kingston are looking forward to this project, Madam Speaker, as it will alleviate significantly the unemployment issues in the constituency. <laughs> Madam Speaker, while, while we while we are happy that these projects, ongoing and future, will indeed create some amount of full-time employment, we are also cognizant that the majority will be short-term, short and medium-term. Therefore, we have been focusing on equipping residents, particularly our young people, with the necessary skill sets which will enable them to secure employment on a more permanent basis. I have directed my councillors to compile a skill bank, which is a list of residents' names and their corresponding skill areas. This list will be circulated to public and private agencies in and around the constituency who may require a particular service or skill set. Also, we have been partnering with Hard Trust to provide skills training for our young people. 35 individuals will participate, Madam Speaker, in a three-month training program in programming and information technology. This program, this program will commence in short order. Additionally, we have been mobilizing and recruiting young people across the constituency for the whole program, which to date stands at 50 beneficiaries. <laughs> Madam Speaker, many of these beneficiaries have transitioned, transitioned from the whole program and are now full-time employees at their respective agencies, including the Social Development Commission and the National Land Agency. <laughs> Madam Speaker, education is the key that unlocks the path to upward social mobility. It is a sector that has been hit hardest by the pandemic. The advent of online learning has created new challenges for parents and students. In an effort to alleviate the challenges, I have, through the CDF, issued over 70 tablets to needy students. The Holy Family Primary School was one of the first schools to benefit from a donation of approximately 150 tablets from the Honourable Minister of Education, Ms. Favor Williams. Thank you, Madam Honourable Minister. The Most Honourable Prime Minister, Andrew Holness, through his Positive Jamaica Foundation, earlier this year, presented 50 devices to students of the constituency. And Madam Speaker, we are indeed happy for these contributions. We make every effort to get these devices into the hands of our children. And we look forward to receiving another 100 under the Ministry of Education Own Your Own Device Program. Internet access is, criti is a critical component of online learning, Madam Speaker. And I wish to use this medium to express my gratitude to the Minister of Science, Energy and Technology, the Honourable Daryl Vaz, and the Universal Service Fund for the installation of the community Wi-Fi 
to the parade gardens era of the constituency. Madam Speaker, this is timely. As we speak, students and residents within the bandwidth of the community center and basic school are now accessing free Wi-Fi. Two more communities will, be, will benefit under phase two and three of the program in short order, and I look forward to the day when the entire constituency will be covered under this community Wi-Fi program. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the issue of improper waste disposal across Kingston and St. Andrew, particularly in constituencies with urban communities, has been perennial. I have been in dialogue with the NSWMA to have them step up their timely collection and enforcement me measures. And I must say, in recent times, we have seen significant improvement in some communities that were main locations for improper garbage disposal. Some of these areas have been transformed into scenic views and adorned with majestic murals. The areas of interest, if you go, Madam Speaker, by these areas now, you will see them totally transformed. The intersection of Beeston Street and Hanover Street, opposite the Kingston Technical High School, Lower South Camp Road at the intersection of Tower Street, the intersection of Sutton Street and Hanover Street, Tower Street across from St. Michael's Primary and Infant School, the intersection of Wellington Street and St. Albans Lane in Franklin Town. Madam Speaker, these locations were otherwise places for where illegal dumping persists. Today, I am indeed pleased to report that they have been transformed. And I want to thank the TPD Cup, uh, Tourism Product Development Company, KCMC, NSWMA, and Stuart Motors, a private entity, for their partnership in, their, in this continued effort to clean up and beautify our constituency. And we will continue until these illegal dump sites become a thing of the past. The Dromedy Gate initiative introduced by the NSWMA was launched in the Alman Town division of the constituency. A total of 50 drums have been distributed, distributed and another batch will be short, distributed shortly. Madam Speaker, this initiative has been very, very effective. And I can say today, Alman Town is looking better since its introduction. <laughs> Madam Speaker, sports and recreation has taken a hit due to the pandemic. We look forward to the day when our recreational spots and play field will be fully opened. I am pleased to report that the Sports Development Foundation of Jamaica has expressed serious interest in a proposal for the rehabilitation of the Ray Town Sports Complex and Recreational Centre located opposite to the Ray Town Fishing Village. Currently, this complex serves as a hub for all recreational, cultural, social, and environmental activities in the community. But it is in need of urgent rehabilitation. This will include, among other things, an, a new netball and basketball court, a jogging trail, astroturf scrimmage area for football, fencing, protective nets, and lighting for nighttime activities. I'm also pleased to report that Grace Kennedy, through its foundation, has given the proposal its blessing and is prepared to partner with, with the SDF and other potential co-funders in making this project a reality. While on recreational spaces, Madam Speaker, I wish to thank the Kiwanis Club of Downtown Kingston for recently refurbishing the Children's Park on Lower South Camp Road into a beautiful green space for the children of Raytown and surrounding communities. Madam Speaker, this park Boasts, uh, it was recently opened. It boasts a walking track, swing, slides, gazebo, which is intended to service a homework facility. Wireless internet connectivity is also available, which will enable the children to access online resources needed to complete their homework and carry out research to enhance their education. Madam Speaker, a lot is happening in Central Kingston. In concluding, Madam Speaker, Contrary to the negative narrative, we have managed to achieve a lot in one year. The pandemic has affected the implementation of some of the plans we have. And I want to take this opportunity to encourage our residents to get vaccinated so we can get back 
to life. And I must say, our residents are beginning to take their health seriously. In a recent vaccination blitz at the Holy Family Primary School, 325 persons were vaccinated. Either to that before we, we couldn't get all 10 persons, Madam Speaker. So the people of the constituency are now taking their health seriously, Madam Speaker. We continue our vaccination efforts in support of the various blitz sites in close proximity to the constituency, such as the National Arena, St. Joseph's Hospital, and the Good Shepherd Inn. Excite exciting times are ahead for this constituency, Madam Speaker. I do not take the electors for granted and I will continue to provide them with effective representation. Yeah. Madam Speaker, if there is ever a government yeah. that can tackle yeah. the developmental challenges of Central Kingston, it is this government led by... It is this government, this government, led by the most honourable Prime Minister, Andrew Holness, a.k.a. Brogan, Madam Speaker. Madam, yeah, uh -huh. Ma Madam, Madam Speaker, is, is she ready? Madam Speaker, Madam, <laughs> Madam Speaker, I think we certainly have been treated today with two of the finest, and it makes the point that this government is strong and the backbench is even stronger. Excellent account of your stewardship, members. And um, Madam Speaker, before I move for the suspension of the state of the constituency debate until tomorrow, I ask for a recommittal of the... Madam Speaker, to make sure that the house is fully in attention. I beg to move that the suspension of the state of the constituency debate until tomorrow at 2 p.m. when the house meets again, at which time the speakers will be the Honorable Uma Davis, a member of parliament for St. James South, Ms. Tova Hamilton, Member of Parliament for Trelawney North, and the man with more land from Westmoreland, <laughs> Mr. Moreland Wilson, Member of Parliament for Westmoreland Western. May it please you, Madam Speaker. The question before the House. Question before the House is for the first of all for the suspension of the um, constituency state of the constituency debate those in favor those against the ayes have it and also the question before us is for the recommittal of the item presentation of bills without leave of the house first obtained those in favor those against the ayes have it minister shaw Madam, Madam Speaker, I now move to introduce and have read a first time a bill shortly entitled the Companies Amendment Act 2021. A bill shortly entitled the Companies Amendment Act 2021 read a first time. 
Madam Speaker, I beg to give notice of second reading of the bill. Madam Speaker, it is not intended to do any further business for the day. I invite you, therefore, to adjourn this House until tomorrow, uh, October 6th at 2 p.m. at the George William Gordon House. May it please you, Madam Speaker. The question before the House is that the House do adjourn until tomorrow, the 6th of October at 2 p.m. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. This house is now adjourned. is brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. When your turn comes for the vaccine,